Um, my name is Maria Bozyski and I'm a Principal Research Analyst here at the AIC. I'd also like to welcome you here today and acknowledge the traditional owners of this land. Georgina Fuller and I work on the National Armed Robbery Monitoring Program, the NARMP or the NARP. Uh, Adam made reference to it earlier on in his opening address. We're going to be doing a bit of a tag team presentation here today. I'm going to start off by telling you a little bit about the program, how it came about, the type of information we collect, and some of the limitations of what we collect, because the NARP is a good example of how the reality of combining data from a variety of sources uh, doesn't necessarily mean we can answer every question we have about what's going on out there in the real world. Then Georgie's going to talk you through some of what we've learnt about armed robbery using the NARP, uh, talking about some of the changes in aspects of this crime that have been observed over time. And then we'll finish off with any questions you might have. Now, why do we examine armed robbery? Well, it's kind of a unique offence because it bridges that gap between property crime and violent crime. And when we talk about armed robbery here in the NARP, we're talking about an offence that's consistent with the Australian Bureau of Statistics definition. That is, the unlawful taking of property with intent to permanently deprive the owner of the property from the immediate possession, control, custody or care of a person or organisation accompanied by the use and or threatened use of immediate force or violence. Now again, consistent with the ABS, when we talk about armed robberies as compared with general robbery, uh, we mean instances of robbery where a weapon was used in the commission of the offence. Even though we've got this single definition, of course armed robbery isn't a single type of offence. Uh, the violence that you see in an armed robbery can range from a threat with an unseen weapon through to a physical harm and even death. And because of this violence, armed robbery can often result in victim trauma that's uh, there over and above the trauma that you'd normally see associated with property theft. Now many of us, when we think of robbery, think of something that looks like this, a masked man in, with a firearm in a bank in broad daylight demanding cash. And this image has been repeated in countless films. It's part of our cultural landscape. But the reality of armed robbery is probably a lot more like this. It usually involves an offender without a firearm. Here we have an offender with a tree branch and a machete. And down here on the bottom, a hug. Now, this is physical intimidation that's veiled to look like a friendly hug um, so that the observing CCTV can't actually see what's going on in real time. Um, this is called a hugging mugging. We also know that typical armed robbery offences most often take place in vulnerable locations, places where there's not a lot of security, places like out in the street or, as you can see here, in convenience stores. By and large, they're not taking place in secure locations, what we call hardened locations. We know, for instance, that bank banks typically only make up a very small proportion of all of the armed robbery locations. Typical armed robberies are also going to happen at times when there's likely to be few witnesses around, so late at night or early in the morning. And they're going to be against victims that are victimised usually just because they're in the wrong place, that vulnerable location at the wrong time, those times when people aren't around to observe what's going on. Now we know that armed robbery looks a lot more like this because we've been monitoring armed robbery here at the AIC for nearly a decade. Our program was originally conceived back in the late 1990s and it came about because senior Australian police officers were interested in the types of weapons that were being used in violent crime. They generally sought to understand how firearms, but then more generally all weapons, were used across all categories of violent crime. But that scope was just a little too broad, so it was narrowed down to look at the types of weapons that were being used in armed robbery as a crime category. A series of pilot analyses and publications culminated in the establishment of the NARMP in 2003, and the first data point we have is 1 January 2003. The three goals of the program are to monitor trends in armed robbery, specifically in weapon use, to identify any changes in those trends and to provide some insight into the factors that might be underpinning any changes in the trends. Ultimately, this information is then used to inform crime prevention efforts. And you can find out more about the NARMP, some of the background information, the processes and the publications at the AIC website. So what does the NARMP contain? What can we learn from it? What can we know? Well, the NARMP contains unit record data. That means we get discrete information. We get one single record for each and every victim of armed robbery. We don't get summary or aggregate information. And we get that information from each Australian uh, state and territory, the police services in all jurisdictions. Now, when we say victim, we mean every victim of armed robbery that's been reported to police. 
uh, we can't gather information about robberies that aren't reported to police. Um, victim surveys tend to suggest that armed robbery isn't one of those crime categories that's subject to high rates of underreporting, but we know that there are some categories of this offence that probably don't get reported to police. So, for instance, if a criminal has their illicit drugs and cash stolen by one of their criminal colleagues, it's unlikely this offence is going to be reported to the police. We've also got a fairly narrow definition of victim. Uh, we only look at those individuals or organisations whose property was the target of the attack. So if a bank teller is robbed of the bank's money, the bank becomes the victim in that instance. It becomes an organisational victim. If the teller then has, say, her purse stolen in the same attack, she also becomes a victim, an individual or person victim. Now we're acutely aware that employees and bystanders are also victims in the sense, as they're under th in the sense that they are under threat and they're also potentially traumatised by the event. But for our purposes, we're only going to look at those people or organisations that are property or financially linked to the incident. We also, by definition, don't look at robberies where there are no weapons. So our hugging mugging isn't included in the NARMP dataset. Uh, the scope of the data sets changed since it was initially uh, set up. For example, we now collect an identifier that allows us to link victims who were involved in the same incident back to that incident. And when the program was first set up, that information wasn't collected. Lastly, the NARP gathers narratives. Now, narratives are those free text reports in police officers' own words that are recorded on police systems. They describe the criminal event in detail, varying levels of detail, I might add. We get narratives relating to a sample of our armed robbery victims from a subset of Australian jurisdictions. Now, all of these unit records, you know, all of the unit record files and the sample of narratives are sent to us here at the ARC once a year. And this is important because it means we don't have live data. After we've received the information and processed it into our data set, which can sometimes, that, that information is sometimes a year old when we get it, it's not then updated by police further down the track. So it's as it stood when it was extracted from police systems. So what exactly do we collect? Well, in any armed robbery event, you're going to have a victim. And the sort of information we aim to gather about victims includes whether they're a person or an organisational victim, their age at the time of the incident, their gender, their date of birth, whether they were injured and whether they put up resistance. Um, obviously, we only get that for person victims. And now I say aim because we aren't able to get all the information about all of the victims in all of the jurisdictions in the same format. The NARP combines information from the eight jurisdictions which all have varying legal definitions of what an armed robbery actually is. There is no single offence called armed robbery that's shared by all Australian states and territories. Each uh, jurisdiction also has differing record management systems and each have differing systems of recording the information into their, their record management. So for example, a piece of information in one state or territory might be filled in using a free field format. In another jurisdiction, it might be a pull down menu, so there's only a small choice of options that they can put into that field. And lastly, each of the jurisdictions have different ways of pulling and compiling that information before they send it to us. Now we endeavour to make all of our variables equivalent, but this can mean we lose some detail when we're combining the records and we have to use very broad categories. For example, one jurisdiction might report that a victim received a minor laceration to their arm. In another jurisdiction, that same piece of information simply might be reported as a minor injury. For our purposes, we have to uh, pull all the information up to that level that just says minor injury, which means the detail's lost. Still, some jurisdictions don't even send us injury information, so it's lacking for a lot of our victims. There are also these same sorts of uh, issues surrounding the information we aim to gather about our offenders, the offenders that have been apprehended for robbing our victims. Uh, the information we gather on offenders includes age and date of birth, gender, their relationship, if any, to their victims. But we do know typically there's no relationship. Usually victims and offenders in armed robbery aren't known to each other prior to the event. Again, this information is subject to jurisdictional differences, so it's less than perfect, and obviously it can't include information about offenders that haven't been apprehended by the police. So we certainly don't know about every armed robber involved with all of our victims. We especially don't know about those robbers who are presumably quite good at what they do and manage to evade apprehension by the police. Now, the last set of variables we receive relate to the incident itself. We look at the type of location where the incident took place, so was it in a bank or was it in the street? whether that location was licensed to sell alcohol, the weapon or weapons that were used, the date and the time of day that it happened, the property taken and the value of that property taken, and lastly, the criminal justice outcome of the armed robbery investigation. 
Importantly, that outcome is only at the time the data were extracted, so obviously if something's transpired after the police have sent us the information, we don't know how the, uh, how the case was resolved. As you've probably guessed, some of these variables are more problematic than others in terms of validly and reliably reflecting what's going on out there in the real world. The property taken in the robbery, for instance, is only broadly indicative of what's gone on. Uh, for instance, uh, when we uh, look at this information, we can only receive up to five items that have been taken in an incident. Often in an armed robbery, many more things are taken, uh, but we don't have the capacity to look at those things. Some jurisdictions aren't able to forward information on the property taken, and uh, these items and the values aren't later confirmed by police because we don't have live data, so they may have been erroneously reported at the outset, but that's what we've got on file. This all means that the variables don't, uh, definitely don't tell us exactly what's been taken in every single armed robbery in Australia, but they can give us a pretty good idea. And this is pretty much true of uh, all armed robbery information. Despite the limitations, our data is still a pretty good indication of what armed robbery in Australia looks like. So what have we learnt about armed robbery to date? Well, the overall number of armed robberies each year has decreased since the NRMP was established in 2003. Some of the findings have been fairly constant across that time though. Around half of all armed robberies are committed using a knife. The lion's share take place in the street or in other public places. And most are against individual people and not organisational victims. We've noticed some changes over time, however, in terms of where offenders target and how they operate. And Georgie's now going to talk you through some of the patterns that we've seen in the data set and show you how narrative information can be used to add some colour to uh, what our sometimes rather dry numbers can indicate. So it's over to Georgie. Thanks, Maria. So what you can take away from, well, hopefully we'll take away from my section of the presentation is that armed robbery is most definitely not a homogenous crime and can vary quite dramatically between incidences. And there is evidence of this in the excerpts of narratives that I'm showing you now. Now, I'd also like to point out that these are direct quotes, so any spelling or grammar mistakes are not reflective on the AIC. Um, but what you are allowed to note from these um, narratives is that armed robbery incidences can vary on a number of different characteristics, including the threat or level of violence that's used, the weapon that's employed, and also even the amount of time that the incident lasts. So we receive police narratives, as Maria said, in order to provide some colour to the variable breakdown information that we also receive. Specifically, a police narrative provides us with highly detailed accounts of what transpired in the armed robbery incident. And this includes information that's not captured in the variable breakdown, such as um, the uh, description of the person of incident, uh, of um, interest, sorry, the victim injury and also the sequence of events and how these factors interplay with um, the other information such as location, weapon and time of day. And this information in particular is useful when trying to classify armed robbery incidences into different typologies or categories. Now behind me is an example of one such narrative and it tells us a number of things about the robbery and I've highlighted the salient points so first of all, we can notice that it occurred on the street, which most likely means it fits into the classification of a mugging. And this is also supported by the fact that the property that was targeted was the victim's bag. However, this narrative also gives us some information about whether or not this was a planned or unplanned mugging. And specifically, I'm talking about the fact that they used a rock and that this occurred on the street where witnesses were. So does anyone want to have a quick guess at whether or not it was planned or unplanned? Unplanned. <laughs> Thank you, up the back. And they're correct. <laughs> it was indeed a not an unplanned robbery because weapons like rocks and branches and glass, we consider them to be highly opportunistic weapons because you'll find them on the ground when the criminal opportunity presents itself. Similarly, the fact that the offender chose to rob on a street where there was a high likelihood, and in this case there were witnesses, shows that there wasn't really much of a contingency plan for when things went wrong. And as you can see, she disengaged and ran away when threatened. So using these narratives, Dupici and Bajewski, um did a review of all of the police narratives in the, um, in the AIC's possession and came up with the following typologies. And these are opportunistic street muggings, like the one we just looked at, planned street muggings, which would, uh, for example, be an incident where an offender rings for a, uh, a pizza and then robs the pizza delivery person. 
um, a professional armed robbery and an amateur retail armed robbery. These two categories probably fit more with the stereotype of what we're used to armed robbery incidences looking like. And finally, residential armed robberies. And interestingly, um, residential armed robberies obviously occur in the home, but are also more likely to occur between a victim and offender who are known to each other. Now, because of time constraints, I'm only going to talk about the following highlighted um, categories of armed robbery, but if you do have any questions regarding the others, um, I'm happy to answer them at the end. And what I've tried to produce with this information is I've taken the characteristics that were identified by DePici and Bajiski and matched them with some of the variables in the NARMP um, incident data sets. However, I would really like to stress that this is in no way an exact science, simply because a number of the distinguishing characteristics we either can't quantify or are not supplied. So for instance, um, things like planning, we can't um, quantify that, so I can't match that to the specific types of armed um, robbery. And further, victim injury, um, which also can distinguish between categories, isn't supplied by all jurisdictions and thus would severely limit the number of cases that we could look at. So therefore, the trends that I present view them more as um, indicative and not an exact representation of what's happening in armed robbery in Australia today. So, moving on. Our very first category of armed robbery that we'll be looking at is opportunistic street muggings. Now these are most likely to occur in a public place or, or on the street and footpath and involve an offender who's using a knife or an opportunistic weapon. And the offender takings are normally small and very much focused on what a victim is likely to have on them at the time. So things like cigarettes, mobile phones and most importantly cash. Um, violence is usually minimal and quite rare because normally victims acquiesce by just handing over their property. And you can see that in the narrative that I presented below. And that's a very good representation of what an opportunistic street bugging is like. So in this instance, the offender approached the victim at the bus stop, demanded money. When the victim didn't have any, the offender basically just settled for the multi-trip bus ticket of $7.20 and then walked away. Very, very small takings in a very short amount of time. However, there's one subcategory to opportunistic street muggings that is quite interesting to look at, and it's those that are committed by very young offenders. And in these instances, we see that um, opportunistic street muggings will still occur on the street and footpath, but they're also likely to occur in parklands or on transport, in transport locations. Um, they're, involved, they're more likely to involve a group of offenders, and these offenders use highly opportunistic weapons, such as broken glass or rocks, things that can be found on the ground. And once again, the offender takings are small. Mobile phones, iPods and cash are the main target. And one of the most important distinguishing features is the highly threatening language that's used and also the level of violence and sometimes significant victim injury that's inflicted. Now the following narrative I think demonstrates just how um, much injury and violence can be used in an armed robbery. So I'm going to read this one out. Um, the victim got off the train at the station and started walking. As he did so, he was confronted by five males aged 14 to 16 years old. They tried to grab the phone out of his hand and then used a cigarette lighter to burn the victim's hands in an attempt to get the phone off him. One of the offenders punched the victim in the head a couple of times. The victim fought back and then tried to run away but was grabbed and thrown to the ground. As he was on the ground, he was kicked by two offenders a couple of times each. They then picked up the pieces of his phone and rode off. So all of that for a mobile phone that they broke themselves. Um, what, what is interesting when you look at uh, situations like this is whether or not um, the robbery was the main um, focus or the motive or whether it was the violence itself. What the narrative and nor the information that we receive allows us to distinguish is motive. But I do want to make a very important point that even though um, you know, it's characteristic to use violence when young offenders in, are involved, not every incident that involves a young offender will automatically have violence and vice versa. Just because it's not a young offender doesn't mean that violence isn't going to be used. So when we look at the trends and when we match this char these characteristics with what we have in the NARMP incident files, we find that overall opportunistic street muggings have been decreasing over the past few years. And this is in line with armed robbery incidences as a whole. And there is a slight increase uh, along the bottom, which is very difficult to see because it occurs in such small numbers, in those occurring in open spaces. However, we don't think this is anything particularly significant. However, when we look at um, those committed by very young offenders, we see that 
While um, fluctuating, overall the trend is increasing, though the sample does remain less than 100 per year. And this is driven once again mainly by the volume of street and footpath robberies that occur. Interestingly, if you look down the bottom, and I actually have no definitive reason as to why this might be occurring, there does seem to be a bit of a mirroring effect between open space and transport locations in that where one goes up, the other goes down and vice versa. Um, I don't have a theoretical reason why this might happen, and what it might indicate once again is the um, difficulties in matching this kind of uh, crime with the data that we receive in the incident file. So moving on to amateur retail armed robbery. Um, the amateur in amateur retail armed robbery can be conceptualised almost as the next step up from opportunistic street muggings. So they have more planning around target selection. However, the MO is considered amateurish and therefore it's distinguished from that of a professional. These types of robberies are often committed, in loca uh, committed by a lone offender who carries a knife and targets what we call a soft location, those with less stringent security practices. Now, um, examples of what might be considered a less stringent security practice could be things like antisocial opening hours, um, obscuring windows with posters and promotional material so as blocking um, natural surveillance from outside, and also unvaried or routine cash handling procedures. Now, importantly, what is targeted in these robberies is the cash or float that's in the till. And the, big, and the offenders will rarely use violence unless the situation moves beyond their control. Further, in some instances, the victim injury is actually incidental. For instance, there was a case where the offender ran at the, at the till wielding a machete threateningly and the victim sort of moved and took the machete in the shoulder. Whether or not that was intentional or um, incidental, we can't tell. Um, so the amateurish nature is actually highlighted in the narrative below, which I actually quite like simply because the victim in this instance was an, an elderly woman in a takeaway store who was clearly presenting the image of a vulnerable victim, but when confronted, told the uh, offender to piss off. <laughs> and the offender uh, ran away. So you can see in that instance, the situation didn't go to plan and the offender didn't have a contingency plan, which sort of distinguishes it from that of a professional armed robbery. Um, when we look at the trend overall, however, once again it is decreasing, which is particularly good news, especially for small businesses. However, and I admit that unfortunately it's not as particularly clear in this graph, but there is an increase in the number of pharmacies and chemists and supermarkets, takeaways and corner stores who are being victimised in armed robbery. And this is also information that we're receiving from the industry themselves. So a lot of work and a lot of good work is currently being done by industry representative groups to help protect and to educate small business owners on ways that they can make it so that they're, um, they're less likely to be victimised in an armed robbery incident. Now the final category that I'll be looking at today is professional armed robbery. And if any of you have seen Ben Affleck's film The Town, that is an excellent representation of how a professional armed robbery group works. Um, so perhaps maybe less attractive, I, I don't know, but I can't talk, maybe they're all attractive. So. Anyways, moving on, <laughs> the locations targeted in a professional armed robbery are banks and other businesses that have very high yields. We're talking thousands of dollars in the till or on the premises. Highly trained, minutely planned and seamlessly executed, these armed robberies involve very skilled offenders. For these offenders, this is their job and some of them are very good at it. And because of this, and also because they're more likely to use uh, weapons such as firearms, they are less likely to use violence because victim control is not as much of an issue. And you can see that, just how seamless this can be in this narrative behind me. So in this instance, the two offenders were very prepared for what was going to face them. They knew exactly that there was going to be a security guard there and how to mitigate that risk by having the security guard walk in front of them. Further, they knew exactly how much money was in the till and where, that, um, where the safe and cash drawers were located and also how to access them. Specifically and importantly, they made off with $50,000 in an incident that lasted less than four minutes. So you can see it was very seamless. They knew exactly what to do. They got in and they got out. But luckily, these are also decreasing. And you can see that as of recently, they've been occurring in um, numbers less than 100. 
And this is mainly you can, um, attributed to the decrease in the volume of uh, licensed premises being victimized in armed robberies. And I think, in part, this decrease can be attributed to the target hardening practices that have been undertaken by these industries. Um, for instance, if we take banks, um, which we've probably, I hope, all been in one at least one time, you can see that they've taken a lot of steps towards increasing the protective factors. So things like fly-up screens, um, better cash handling procedures that takes the cash away and stores it securely as soon as possible, as well as um, just their general layout, the way the bank um, branches are designed, have all helped to increase those protective factors and decrease the likelihood of armed robbery victimisation. So in conclusion, armed robbery has been and continues to be in decline, though it is necessary that we recognise it for the varied and diverse criminal offence that it is. Um, we need to move away um, from the stereotype of the bank, the firearm defender and the getaway car because this is simply not the norm given that the majority of armed robberies are occurring on the street and footpath. Further narratives such as the ones that I've shown you today I think highlight that armed robbery is more than just statistics and it can actually have a devastating effect on the victim both financially and emotionally. And this is one of the reasons why armed robbery remains one of the most important areas of monitoring that we do here at the AIC. And for me personally, um, one of the more fascinating areas of research. <laughs>